Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the second day of our keynote workshop. We're really excited to have Dr. Marsha Lovett again today, presenting on promoting students' self-directed learning. Um, for those of you who were unable to make yesterday's um, keynote or were a little late, Marsha C. Lovett is Associate Vice Provost for Teaching, Innovation, and Learning Analytics at Carnegie Mellon University. In addition, she is director of CMU's Eberly Center for Teaching Excellence and Educational Innovation, and also as well, a teaching professor in the Department of Psychology. Um, okay, so I'm now going to change over to Marsha. Um, there we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I am delighted to be here with you today again, and I hope you had some great breakout session conversations yesterday. Today, our focus is on self-directed learning, which is uh, near and dear to my heart, um, and I'll share with you three reasons why it's particularly special to me. The main one is that I think as a fellow faculty member, I like to think about my role not only as helping to support my students' learning of key knowledge and skills in my discipline, but also helping them um, learn the more general skills of being uh, lifelong learners, uh, learning the skills to promote their own learning and to do that in a way that they can apply it in my own course, but also take it forward into their future uh, studies and life. So we'll be talking about that today. And I will kick things off and put my slides up on the screen. So hopefully you can all see that. Yep. Perfect. Um, and I want to start off by sharing with you all a pair of two learners, a tale of two learners, we could call it. Um, and here is the first learner um, who's approaching an assignment. You could imagine it as an assignment in one of your courses. Um, and her name is Emily. And um, to be honest, Emily's slightly worried about this assignment. The deadline is coming up. And here's Emily, Emily's approach. She realizes that the assignment due date is right after playoffs in Pittsburgh. We know that's a big thing. And uh, so you pick your sport. And um, looking at the project's focus, um, she recognizes also that it's um, a bit out of her comfort zone and notes that she has some gaps in knowledge or skill that are um, contributing to that worry. What does Emily do? Well, she sets a plan to start her work on this assignment early, in particular finding ways to address the key gap. Once she's engaged in working on the assignment, she intermittently stops to self-assess. So that is our first learner, Emily. And I wanna contrast that with, um, Monica, who is also anxious, but here's a description of Monica's approach to, let's say, the same exact assignment in your course. Um, Monica's concerned because the focus of this assignment is something she also considers a weakness, um, but she doesn't really think of that in terms of addressing the gap, just in terms of um, kind of a fixed mindset that she will be at a disadvantage. Um, she doesn't make any explicit plan except to recognize, well, I'm going to have to work really hard because this is going to be a tough one. Um, even though that's her explicit plan, I mean, that's her uh, approach of working hard without that specific plan, she ends up starting only a few days before the assignment is due and ends up having to rush through without any chance for monitoring her progress as she goes. So what I'm wondering if um, you all would think about and even share with the group um, your thoughts about what difference between Emily's and Monica's approach stands out the most to you, maybe because you think it's the most important thing that differs between them or something that you've actually seen in your students. And we're asking folks to go to the questions panel and just type in really quickly what you would like to highlight as a key difference. And then one of our facilitators, Ellen, I think after a few of these come in, she'll read them off and share them with us all. 
So let's um, hear your thoughts on this to get the okay. session. Okay. I have I have some um, answers here. Uh, Suzette McKenzie said um, she sees uh, the difference in planning. Um, and Sheila Cuffey, uh, Emily has a plan, and Monica sees focus as. Sorry, let me just open this. Emily has a plan, and Monica does not. Mm -hmm. And Diane Diane Martona says uh, Monica sees focus as a weakness. Set back right off the bat. Uh, Natalie Graska says what stands out to me is Emily addresses the gap in her learning. Ah. Um, Alexis Chanto says Emily has a much more organized methodic approach. She will be successful. Um, and Joe Pudelsnek making a plan to address knowledge preparedness gaps. Um, Danielle Sharon says, when to start. Yeah, uh, those are all important. Is there one more, Ellen, before we move on? Uh, there are several more. Okay. Um, I can stop at one more. Uh, Kristen Nutter says, Emily self-assesses at multiple points in project. Perfect. So one of the things I heard in, in especially those first responses is that folks really keyed off the difference between these two learners in terms of their planning. Um, another thing that seemed to be uh, a focus that we'll definitely want to talk about is how uh, students respond to um, either being out of their comfort zone or having a gap or a perceived weakness either addressing it or taking it as a setback. And those are really important. And then we also heard about the self-assessment that differs between these two learners. So those give us, those comments give me a sense of where your focus is, but really I think there are a lot of differences that we're all probably um, experienced with from the teacher point of view, um, as well as maybe the learner point of view, I know I am. And this is what led myself and my colleagues to generate a model of self-regulation drawn from lots and lots of articles in the literature to say, okay, if we take and compile all that research, what are the key steps that researchers have honed in as important components of the ideal self-regulated learner? And so you can see, I've put Emily's sort of uh, responses here on the right that there are five key steps to this process. It's another cycle, like yesterday. Um, and we can kind of start at the top with this idea of assessing the task, paying attention to what um, the goals of the task are, what's going to be needed, and then evaluating one's own strengths and weaknesses in light of that task. Emily certainly does that. She's thinking about the deadline of the task, um, what it's going to ask of her, and then relates that to an, a noted gap that she wants to address. That leads into planning as part of this process. And Emily has some really nice components to her plan, which I think is not always what we see or even experience. And then um, the final point about Emily is this uh, fourth bubble. I don't know if, can you see my cursor over here? Um, in the uh, in the cycle that when one is actually in the midst of doing a task, it's actually possible and, and quite a nice part of self-regulated learning to be monitoring as you go. And so these are all things that we see Emily um, demonstrating and a lot more than Monica, by contrast. We don't know what happened after this assignment was uh, due and submitted. Um, we might guess that after Emily got her assignment back, maybe she would have done some reflecting and adjusting because that is the final part that then reinforms the learner in the next cycle of self-regulated learning. So this is really um, what we in the uh, How Learning Works book compiled to pull together as an ideal model, recognizing that not all students will um, subscribe to all these steps, um, but really um, thinking about aspirationally, um, this is really what we want our students to be able to do. 
And here's the second reason this idea of self-regulated learning is really near and dear to my heart. Um, it happens to be the seventh principle in this book that my co-authors and I um, put together, um, but it was actually the first one that we wrote and I was the key author of that chapter. So we kind of started with the last chapter first um, and it really set the tone for the book in thinking about what was important to us um, in working with our faculty colleagues. And it is the case that a lot of faculty are interested in promoting self-regulated learning but don't always have um, the time or the, the strategies to weave it into their busy teaching uh, schedules. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, maybe you already are like me and this is a really important um, part of teaching and learning to you, but in case this is something that you're not necessarily used to thinking about or valuing, I just wanted to say a little bit about why we all can and should care about SRL, self-regulated learning and metacognition. And these are, um, this is sort of my own paraphrase of a few folks work in this uh, literature that uh, makes the point that students benefit from metacognition because it enables them to reflect on their own approaches to learning, accurately assess what they do and do not know, and make better choices as a result. Now, I've, I've emboldened that last part of that um, description because that's really, I think, a really uh, important reason that this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart is that I wanna help my students make better choices. And in fact, there's a college student in my family who happens to be my son at present, and um, any of the parents in the webinar might also be thinking that it's one of the things that we want for our kids is to make better choices. Thinking back to my own college days, I know I made some good and I made some poor choices. So I think this idea about helping students and the learners in our courses engage in these self-regulated learning processes so they can make those more deliberate, more informed choices is really gonna help them in so many ways. Um, so that is um, one way of um, crystallizing why this is such an important process. Um, that said, it tends to be something that slips through the cracks in the curriculum. And so I think it's fair to ask, any students who are uh, in formal learning environments, um, what do they do well in this cycle and where do they struggle? Um, and that is actually our first poll question. So I'll put this slide up and then ask our facilitators to open the poll. I'm kind of curious with your experience in the teaching and learning sphere, what you would um, identify as the one area that gives your students the most trouble or that you would most like to see them improve. Assessing the task, evaluating their own strengths and weaknesses, planning, monitoring as they go, or reflecting and adjusting for next time. So we'll give folks a few minutes to put in their choices. I'll also use this to emphasize certain points based on where your interest lies. We're at about a 60% response rate, and we'll just give it a little bit more. Great. Okay, we have about 80% who have voted, so I'm gonna close the poll now. Let's see the results. Okay. So we have um, assessing the task and planning the task and reflecting and adjusting for next time were um, among the top with planning being the um, most often, but this is actually a relatively even distribution of comments. So this is really interesting to see um, that folks are saying, um, you know, quite a variety of these are ones that they are seeing among their students um, trouble spots or might wanna focus on. Well, I'll be sure to make, um, make a lot of mention of planning as well as the other two relatively high, but we will cover all five of these. 
So um, be on the lookout for the one that you're most interested as we proceed. Great, thank you, Hannah. I guess we'll go back to the slides now. Perfect. Um, I think one other thing that I want to mention before moving to the uh, next point is that it's actually natural that students would have difficulty in these areas and that you all would be seeing your students struggle in more than one area or across these different areas. Because if you think about it, do we really give students direct instruction or kind of, you know, concerted practice and feedback in these areas. These are skills and uh, knowledge areas just like any others. And so what we're gonna talk about is how we can find um, motivation and um, information from the literature to actually guide our work in giving students some guidance and support in these five areas. So the approach that I'll take in this uh, session is to um, start by giving you some quick overview of research on students' natural tendencies with each step to see how your experiences align with what the research says about where students struggle. And then we will transition to talk about strategies along with a bit more evidence for how we can teach students these steps and really consider it a part of the uh, teaching and learning experience. So we'll jump in and talk about the research. Um, what does it say for where students naturally tend to be with regard to these components of self-regulated learning? So I'm gonna start with the first piece of that, which is assessment. And um, the quick summary is that students often do not assess the task that they're given. Um, here's a particularly striking um, result of that, where uh, students in college were given a writing assignment and fully half of them, when they were observed as they began to um, complete the writing assignment, completely ignored the instructions and used their generic strategy they had learned from high school when that was clearly not what this assignment was designed to evoke. So you have a lot of students um, coming to assignments that have been carefully crafted by us faculty, and they're just not really um, paying the attention they need to assess what is the task asking and what is going to be required. So that's pretty informative for us as faculty members that students' natural tendency is not to assess the task. The second step of the self-regulated learning cycle is students assessing themselves, their own strengths and weaknesses relative to a given task. And there's a lot of work on um, measuring students' self-assessment accuracy. Again, you can see the summary up top. Basically, students are not good at this. It's actually really hard to self-assess how well one is doing without external information. So if you look at this plot I've started here on the slide, let's say students' actual performance on a task is plotted on the horizontal axis, and students' self-assessment, how well they think they're doing, is plotted on the vertical axis. Now, if students were perfectly accurate, this would be a diagonal line. You know, they're, uh, they actually perform low, they think they perform low. They actually perform high on the high end, their self-assessment is high, and everywhere in between is this nice, straight, linear, um, y equals x uh, relationship. Now, you just might wanna think about where do you think the actual self-assessment data come in? Do you think it's uh, shaped in a different way than this diagonal? And if so, you just take a moment to kind of visualize in your mind where you think students actually are in terms of their self-assessment. Okay, here is the um, set of results from one study, very consistent across the board. So let me walk you through two particular things that I see as relevant to this actual result. Um, what we observe is that students who are less effective at performing a task, that is they're at the low end in actual performance, they're actually overconfident. They're overestimating 
their actual, they're, they're self-assessing higher than they actually are performing. So this is a kind of overconfidence that um, is prevalent in novices, new uh, folks new to a task, and in general, those who are performing at a lower level. Um, on the other hand, it's a smaller effect up here on the high end, but there is actually the opposite effect such that we see learners who are high in their actual performance are underconfident. That is, they're underestimating their actual performance. Um, so I'm thinking this might ring a bell with folks who um, have worked with students. Um, something that is very common with novices is they don't know what they don't know. So on the left-hand side, they're these overconfident folks naturally not being able to accurately self-assess, whereas the more you know, the more you know what you don't know, and that may contribute to the underestimating we see on the higher end. Bottom line, students are going to have difficulty accurately assessing themselves, and then that's going to influence the whole self-regulated learning process. So we also need to pay a lot of attention to this component of the cycle. And I like to uh, compare this to um, a famous Darwin quote that says, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge, which really captures especially the left-hand side of this result. Okay, so we've gone through assessing the task and evaluating one's own um, self-assessment, strengths and weaknesses. What about planning? Well, can you see there's a pattern here? Many students don't plan, or if they do plan, they plan poorly. And so I've picked just a sampling of two research studies in this area, one in writing, the other in science. Um, if you compare less, excuse me, this should say more versus less effective writers, it's the less effective writers who plan less appropriately. So they're not actually engaging in the process that would help them get better. Similarly, comparing novices and experts in physics, the novices or more student um, type learners take more time to solve the problems. Of course, you'd expect that, but they're not spending that much time in planning. In fact, even though experts are so much faster overall, they're spending more absolute time planning than novices do when novices are taking so much more time overall. So we've got evidence that um, planning is also not an area where we can rely on students um, bringing this uh, skill to help their self-regulated learning. And I wasn't surprised that this came out in your own comments comparing Emily and Monica um, the last part of the cycle has to do with monitoring and adjusting, so I've just rolled that into one. Um, <clears throat> pattern continues. <laughs> it's hard for folks, and I should say a lot of these results transcend just uh, official students in a formal learning capacity. I think we're all subject to these um, tendencies um, of self-regulated learning being difficult. So I like to think about this last result on this slide that people often continue to use a familiar strategy that works moderately well, rather than switch to a new strategy that would be much better. So um, this happens all the time when folks get into a routine and say with your um, current, whatever your current software package is, maybe for word processing or whatever, that you can do okay, um, but you're not um, necessarily optimizing and adjusting your approach based on what's possible. Um, also, we find in the literature that um, folks who have trouble solving certain problems, they just continue to use the same strategy even after it has failed. Um, and you might have seen that in your students where, um, you know, tying back to yesterday's um, discussion of feedback, sometimes it's hard for students to iteratively improve because they just don't know how to weave adjustment into their approach. So um, with that set of findings on the five steps of the cycle, I'm happy to open up for questions or comments that folks might have. Um, Ellen will be happy, I'm sure, to take a look at the questions panel. If you have something you'd like to share at this point, let's take a brief break and see what is on your mind.
I'm not seeing any new questions at this point in time. Okay, we'll just give folks a moment. Oh, someone said, oh, someone would like to speak. Um, so here are some new comments. Uh, good students tend to think um, they did worse than they did. Um, poor students do the opposite. That is a Nancy Tosh comment. Um, I've seen that myself. Um, and many of these cited studies are in excess of 20 years old. How do more tech savvy and or millennials factor into this research and findings? That was a question oh, by Michael O'Donnell. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really good question. Actually, um, that's, that reminds me of a, a relatively recent study. I think it was 2013 or 2014 um, that ties in really well to this. Um, and this study was conducted with um, current uh, sort of traditional college age students and a little bit older, so um, young 20 year olds. And they were um, asked to report whether they thought they were good at dual tasking, um, something that digital, um, <laughs> digitally savvy students do a lot of. I think we all probably do quite a bit. Uh, you know, doing one thing at the same time as another, maybe on um, digital devices. So students reported whether they thought they were good or bad at that. That was kind of was their self-assessment. And then these researchers actually asked the same, the very same set of students, the uh, learners, to come in to uh, do some dual task activities. And as it turns out, <laughs> um, everyone was pretty poor at dual task relative to single task. But actually, those who thought they were good, were at, good at dual tasking, were actually a little bit worse at it than those who thought they were poor. So this was another example of um, kind of the, the um, that overconfidence that the, the students who were relatively poor at actually dual tasking were the ones who reported the most confidence or um, the greatest strengths in that area. So um, yes, I, I appreciate your noting. Those are kind of classic studies, my go-to studies in this area, but we do see that the results are maintained in looking at modern um, students and even looking at these issues in terms of uh, digital uh, work that's quite prevalent today. So thank you for that. Um, another question by Jerry Rutledge. What about students who do not cover material then complain they are confused or lost? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so that's a really good one because there the student is um, sort of not even engaging in the work and not either recognizing or admitting that. So I think that's a great opportunity for um, making sure that um, the, way I, the way I might put it is that uh, we can hold students accountable to, to doing work and really ask them about what they have and haven't done. And um, maybe it's an opportunity to say, okay, I recognize you haven't done the work. Tell me if you were about to sit down and do it right now, how would you approach it? So it gives you an opportunity to turn this um, student who's sort of shirked a bit of their responsibility into perhaps a little mini lesson on self-regulated learning strategies. If you have that opportunity, I think that would be a really great way to address it. Um, because we never know what the reasons our students have or the sort of underlying diagnosis for why they're doing or not doing the things they are. And I think sometimes it's maybe they don't know what to do or they're um, feeling unconfident in what to do. So that could be one way to address that challenge. Thanks for sharing. Um, maybe Ellen, at this point we'll move on, but if there were others, feel free to hold those um, and bring them back up because we'll have one or two other question segments in our time together. Certainly. Great. Okay. 
So um, I thought I would just put this image up to kind of give a quick research summary um, of where students' uh, tendencies naturally lie in terms of engaging in these self-regulated learning processes. So there's a lot of room for improvement. That's the sort of silver lining here, glass half full. And what I want to talk about next is that uh, we do have actually a lot of evidence, and it's mounting evidence, that these kinds of skills can be taught. And again, there's uh, multiple studies on this. I just picked one where students were given 30 to 45 minutes of side training on how to plan their approach to learn a certain topic, how to monitor their learning as they go, and then reflect um, on how they did before continuing. Um, and you can see that the um, pre to post test gain for students in a condition that received that SRL training versus students who did not is quite big. This was um, about a two point difference on a 12 point um, test. So that's a pretty fair proportion. Um, of course, you know, if I were in the audience right now, I'd be saying, well, I can't spend 30 to 45 minutes teaching my students metacognitive skills above and beyond all the other stuff that I'm doing. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to actually talk about how we can weave self-regulated learning strategies into our teaching that don't require this kind of extra um, extracurricular um, self-regulated learning training. And we will talk about those strategies in two, two chunks, sort of the preparatory part, which is assessing evaluating strengths and weaknesses and planning. We'll tackle those first. So I drew from uh, some of the strategies in the book to share with you, and these I think will be available for you all to discuss in the afternoon. Um, notice I put a kind of a check mark next to two of them because based on what we talked about yesterday, the great thing is that strategies that promote one mechanism of learning, like practice and feedback, as we talked about yesterday, can often be really helpful in promoting another positive mechanism of learning. So in terms of supporting students to assess the task more effectively and assess their own uh, strengths and weaknesses, two things we talked about yesterday are already going to help students with self-regulated learning as well. One is being explicit about the assignment goals. That's really making clear to students what the task is all about, what you want, what you don't want, and providing those rubrics or performance criteria. Um, what we talked about yesterday along the lines of these two strategies is providing students with that information is the foundation. But if we can be even more um, highlighting of this information to students so that they really use it while they're working on our assignments, that's going to make these strategies even more effective. So I think we've kind of covered those. Um, the other two have to do with um, checking students' understanding of the task and providing students with some opportunities to self-assess, bearing in mind we want to help them to be more accurate at that so that they go into the task with um, more um, effective approach than if they were just left to their own self-assessment. So um, we'll come back to those in a moment. Um, for planning, um, one strategy is to have students implement a plan that you provide, eventually letting them to uh, plan on their own. I think that the um, milestones approach that you all use in many of your design-oriented courses are um, illustrative of that strategy, that the milestones are really essentially helping students plan out their work and giving them um, intermediate points to check in and get feedback. So um, the, the, the piece, the sort of add-on piece for that is thinking about how to scaffold students to take that approach into their own work and to do that similar planning on their own. So that's the second half of that strategy. And I think that one way to go about this is the final bullet here on screen, which is creating an assignment that focuses on planning and providing feedback to students on their plans. What I really like about that is it's emphasizing to students that planning is important. I don't necessarily want you to do the task, or maybe don't do it right now. 
I want us to focus and spend some time on the planning process. And so I'm curious if that's a strategy that you all could weave in to your work. Okay, so this is kind of the first half of the self-regulated learning cycle. Do folks have thoughts on those strategies? I'll put them back up. Or other comments um, that you're already doing or that you would like to do, but you see some challenges with doing to support students' self-regulated learning strategies. Um, feel free to type in your comments, suggestions, uh, further questions into the questions panel, and we'll see if any crop up. Ellen will share them, and I'll be happy to discuss them. Well, I see one by uh, Patty Jo Bolami, and, and she's uh, mentioned something before, but it kind of plays into it. She says, don't you think that student expectations about their course and teacher play into the expectations of how well they will do with the course? That is a great point. Um, I want to come back to that um, in the next slide. Let's see. Hold on. I don't have it here. Um, I have a picture of the um, cycle coming up, and I do resonate with that point. There's actually quite a lot of research that students' beliefs about learning and their expectations of their abilities do play a big role. And I didn't emphasize it yet, but inside that cycle of self-regulated learning, there's a little icon of a person and it says student beliefs. And um, what we emphasize in this chapter in the book is that one ingredient is helping students with the steps of self-regulated learning. And another equally important part is supporting students' beliefs about their own abilities, about their expectations of what's possible. And so those beliefs can play a big role as well. And I'll definitely pick up on that more when we get a little bit later into our time together. So thank you for raising that. Good insight. Uh yeah, and, and uh, per, uh, this is kind of a, a, a question relating to this particular slide uh, by Mike Buttles. What single element are the overconfident students skipping? Ah, that's a good one. So the overconfident students, I think mostly where they're having trouble is in this pre-assessment phase. And it's probably that they are either not assessing themselves very deliberately and just assuming that they're ready or, or, or quite good at something when they may have some areas for improvement, or they may be still on the novice side and they're thinking they're performing better than they accurately are because that's part of their novice hood that they just don't know. Um, in fact, I think I have, um, a little focus on that. I think really what those students, the overconfident students can benefit from is our help to support them in making more accurate self-assessments before they begin an assignment. And there are a few ways we can do this. Um, one that I think can um, roll into your uh, typical Art Institute courses perhaps quite smoothly is to prompt students to look outside themselves for how they're doing. So to get their self-assessment based on evidence from maybe their past performance. So if you're doing one of those um, courses that has multiple projects along the way, or um, uh, a course that has multiple milestones along the way, or if you have students who are maybe more along in their program of study, they might have um, past performance and feedback that you can suggest they actually literally go and look to a prior assignment that seems relevant and see what feedback they got. And look at that to try to analyze a current um, area for improvement. Um, you could also ask them to engage with you on that as a check that they've been um, accurately, come to an accurate conclusion about their self-assessment. So I think that's one way we can help those students is to encourage them not just to make their own best guess as to their approach, their strengths and weaknesses, but looking for outside. And then the other is if you are going to ask students to self-assess, 
there's some evidence to suggest that if we phrase these self-assessment questions carefully to be more concrete and specific, we can pull students a little bit out of their tendency for inaccurate self-assessment. So I have an example of that here. Um, if you have students are going to be doing an assignment X, you could say, OK, students, if you have to do this task X, which of the following best describes you? And then these are relatively concrete that students could actually imagine, would I need to ask for assistance or would I need to look to resources to do this? Could I do it without assistance, but only in easy cases, without assistance, but in more challenging cases? Or am I so good that I could actually explain and teach it to others? And it's one thing to ask students, do you know how to X, where they might be more than willing to say, oh, yeah, I know it. But if you ask them to put it on the line and say, could you actually explain this to others, they, um, they tend to be um, less overconfident and more accurate in their self-assessments. So I think those are some good strategies to help out there. Thank you for that question. Um, and with that, maybe I'll just move along because we do have two more areas for thinking about strategies we can weave into regular coursework. And these have to do with strategies on the second half of this cycle, so to speak, of monitoring, reflecting, and adjusting. Um, and here I wanted to share a few strategies. Um, the one I'll emphasize is this first one about asking students to annotate their work during the process. Now, I remember that um, this idea of self-monitoring did not come up as a, a, a strongly endorsed weakness of your students in the first poll, um, but there's actually a lot of evidence that promoting students to monitor while they're doing a task can actually be really effective for learning. So um, this is possibly an area for focus. And then we have a few other strategies on the reflection part of the process. Um, I think that just in general, we as teachers can do a lot to provide students the opportunity or the assignment to reflect on their performance. And there are lots of ways to do this, um, to weave into teaching that can really extend a learning experience and help students generalize, not just what did I learn about how to do this one assignment, but really helping students look back on what they did and vision forward to how that can help them in the future or how they might want to um, improve further in the future. So I wanted to focus a bit on two of these strategies and just give you a really quick rundown of um, one is a little bit of uh, research on how these are effective and how we can implement them in our teaching. So um, first of all, let me just say, we, like I mentioned, we do have evidence that self-monitoring, encouraging students to do this while they're working is effective and promotes learning. So one result is that when students explain to themselves while they're studying or reading, um, uh, they actually become um, better problem solvers and they retain more of what they learn. It's sort of an example of active studying or active reading rather than passive. Um, and students who are trained to self-explain as they're studying learn more. That's another result we know from the literature. The one that I thought might be quite applicable to a lot of the folks in this session is um, some results that students who annotate while they're writing gain value from it. And the faculty members also see value from this. Here are just a few quotes from that bit of research. One is a student who said, when I made comments on my own writing, I was able to reformulate my thoughts to make them more logical and clear. Another student said, I really like metacognitive comments because they make me think more about what I'm writing and give the reviewer a better idea of what I'm thinking. Um, this could be something that I think applies relatively naturally outside of writing to any kind of project work um, where you might invite students to annotate their work, um, kind of sort of set up a dialogue with you as they are um, preparing to submit work. So you might want to ask students as they're working on a project to continually be um, thinking about 
Do I understand what I'm doing right now? Am I reaching my goals or the goals of this task? And do I need to make changes? Maybe there's even a way that you could engage students to um, annotate their work with their responses to these questions in some of those milestone assignments. And finally, um, there are lots of ways we can invite students to reflect. Um, a particular technique that I've developed is called an exam wrapper. Um, it applies in the case of an exam that when students receive their graded exam, they do a short reflective exercise. But um, I think I'm going to show you here, it's, it's got a more general quality than that. So let me just quickly run through. Here is what students are asked when they receive back their graded work. How did I study for the exam? That is sort of what was I doing before and during? And then they're asked, how, how did I, where did I perform well versus not? So they're asked to analyze the outcome and then answer the question, how will I approach studying for the next exam? Um, this has been shown to help students perform better on subsequent exams when they engage in this process. It kind of invites them to actually change their approach rather than keep doing things the same way. And we've started working with folks outside of the sciences to apply this approach of um, reflection assignments and using this variation on the prompt questions. So I'm, I'm curious if folks think that these kind of reflection prompts might fit into some of your teaching. Basically, I'm going to come back to that original uh, paraphrase that, that I shared that um, really the idea behind this reflection is just like metacognition and self-regulated learning in general, we're sort of supporting students and prompting them to make better choices next time. And next time may be the next assignment in our course, or it may be the next um, assignment or job they do outside of our course. All right. So we are, this is what I had prepared for us to go through. Um, just a quick summary of takeaways on self-regulated learning. You can see that um, inside this cycle, there is this component of students' beliefs about intelligence and learning influencing. Although that wasn't my emphasis today, it certainly is another factor that's relevant. So I thank the person who asked about that. Um, the summary of what we did discuss today is that um, we know from the literature that students tend not to do very well on these steps. Um, so um, the question is, can they get better? And research shows that yes, students with um, the appropriate instruction and some opportunity to practice, they can get better and develop these skills. The result is they become better learners. And even some of the relatively small teaching strategies um, that we talked about toward the end are ways to promote that. So I encourage you to think about how your own teaching can be one way to help students in their development as self-regulated learners. With that, I will um, post up here two things just for you to think about and look at. Um, one is that there are some breakout questions that are really um, prompting folks to think about which of these strategies might you have used already? Which would you like to try? So hopefully you'll have some time later today to talk about that in your groups. And just um, as we go into a final Q&A period, I'll post um, this slide up for folks to look at some of the strategies we discussed for promoting self-regulated learning. Uh, with that, I'll ask maybe um, folks if you have any questions uh, concluding comments, reactions, responses, please go to your questions panel and type them in now. Um, and we'll see uh, if there are some comments and questions. Alan will, I'm sure, be glad to share them with us all. Um, but until then, thank you for your uh, participation and attention so far. And we'll see what the final questions hold. Yes, I have a question from Effie Karakatos. And um, this is. Uh, uh, she wants to know if this research is based on ground, online, or both. It seems to apply well to both types. Well, what distinctions have been found, if any, between online 
on, and on ground students. Great, yeah, thanks for that question, Effie. Um, there are examples of both in the research that I cited, but also in the general literature here. Um, just to give you one particular one <clears throat> that I'm remembering that was um, mentioned in this session that was an online example was actually that study I mentioned where someone did the 30 to 45 minutes of self-regulated learning training. Um, that was an online instructional environment where students were given the training uh, uh, for um, planning their approach to studying, uh, monitoring as they go, and reflecting. And their learning was actually in an online learning environment. And that was the one that showed that students who had those self-regulated learning strategies in their belt from thanks to that training did considerably better in a pre to post test measure. So that's just one example, but from all the literature that I'm aware of, we see, as you, as you predicted, that these um, results really apply to both formats of instruction. Thank you for that comment and question. That's a really good thing to raise. Uh, another um, point that Alexis Chanto, Chantos mentioned, uh, an interesting story, students um, at, were asked uh, for help at a particular engineering school were first told to explain the problem to a teddy bear that was kept in the classroom. Very often the student explained it to the teddy bear. The student very often told the teacher, never mind, I figured it out. <laughs> That's great. I just learned about this the other day from someone who was in um, computer science. And instead of a teddy bear, their example was a rubber duck. So sometimes when you're at an impasse or you're stuck, explaining to even an inanimate object can be really powerful. And I think that's essentially, I mean, just think about if you can help your students to bring that into their habits of mind, that could be pretty powerful. Um, you know, when you're stuck, uh, okay, it's natural to freeze up. You don't know what to do, so you don't know what to do, of course, but just try to take a deep breath and explain to yourself, to the mirror, to you know, the apple on your desk, the teddy bear in the corner, um, what you're thinking right now. And it often can lead to some really positive outcomes. This relates to the self-explanation research that I mentioned. Um, you might think that students who explain to themselves when they're studying, um, that that helps only when students are explaining things correctly. Um, but actually the researchers found that regardless of whether the students were self-explaining and saying sort of correct things versus not so correct things, they still benefited in terms of the learning and their subsequent problem solving performance. And the, the explanation behind that is it's not about what the students were explaining, but just the, the process of engaging in that self-explanation makes uh, one a more active learner, and that's the real um, benefit that um, the students got from the process. So yeah, thank you. So now I know about rubber duck and teddy bears as being useful learning partners. That's wonderful. Um, Mike Buttles um, has a, a question. Do you see a relationship between how students think outside of class and in class? And if so, how can we merge these thinking processes? That is a really good question. <clears throat> I'm thinking of some research that is actually, um, it's not in the discipline of design, or artistic works um, or even humanities. It's in the domain of mathematics where um, folks actually studied the strategies that people use in an academic or inside class scenario for approaching mathematical problems was completely different from how they approach problems in their daily life. And the example they gave, there were two examples. Um, a person who's at the grocery store trying to pick between two products and find which is actually the cheaper um, per quantity 
uh, and doing basically some mathematical calculations to make that decision, um, but couldn't do the analogous thing in class. And someone who was on Weight Watchers and had to sort of divvy out uh, portion control and whatnot and was doing some pretty intense fractional calculations um, with their food, but wasn't doing the same when it was um, an in-class situation. So I definitely resonate with this challenge that sometimes students use very different approaches outside the classroom and inside the classroom. And helping students merge those can be really helpful because often they can draw strength from one area to the other. It could probably go in both directions. Now, tying that to the idea of self-regulated learning, I might link it in to this idea of helping students assess their strengths and areas for improvement. You know, if we think about students who may, um, may feel like um, they are having difficulty with a current task or something like that, um, maybe they're assessing themselves not, uh, as, not that strong in being able to um, achieve the task at hand, it could be helpful to ask them to think about other areas where they have related skills they can draw on. Um, and even mention to them that sometimes students naturally, we all, I think, naturally build silos in our minds for how we do things in one context to another. So it could be useful to bring this to students' attention and really get them to think about multiple contexts inside of class, outside of class, when they're assessing their strengths and areas for improvement. I'm not sure about research on that, but that kind of seems like a, a really interesting tie-in to me. And maybe that's something you can explore in your own teaching. So thanks for that comment. Is there perhaps one more question, Ellen, or should we break? Um, I see one other comment that um, Patty Jo put in here, and she went that one good assignment was to complete um, you know, instructions that a fifth grade student would know. Yes. You had to be really, had to really understand the task to be able to explain it clearly to a fifth grader. Yeah, that's a really good one. So um, asking students to be so clear in explaining what the task is that a fifth grader could understand it. That's a really great one. Yeah, thanks. Maybe that's something folks can weave in to uh, their teaching. Thank you for that comment. Um, and maybe that's a good time to wrap up. I'm not sure, but I've had a great time with you all today and yesterday. I really thank you for the opportunity to share this uh, discussion on some topics uh, related to teaching and learning, and I wish you all the best. Oh, Doug, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marshall. It's great to have you for both these days. Um, I think some really interesting uh, points were made, observations, and I know the breakout sessions yesterday were quite good. Sorry, that's going to always happen right when I'm talking. Um, so I know my breakout sessions went really well. A lot of good ideas came out of the se out of the session, and I'm I'm sure today that same will happen. I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, Hannah, thank you very much for all your work in organizing this. It really came out well. Uh, the faculty training committee too, uh, my Kerwin, Rochelle, and Ellen, and Jeremy, all of you. Everyone did really good in just supporting the the uh, keynote workshop um, and Dean Cooper for sp sponsoring this. I think it, it really was a valuable time for everyone. Um, there are surveys, by the way, at the uh, when you wrap up or when you close out of the webinar, there's a survey. Um, so we'll, we'll be really interested to see what everyone thinks. So please fill those out. Really interested to see what you think about this format that we provided. You know, the idea of a two day sort of focused uh, workshop with breakouts. Um, so perhaps you know, if it's something people like, we can we can do that again. Um, anyway, thanks everyone. Uh, please attend a breakout session. You can go to the Spark uh, page. It's on the link in the chat area to register for breakout session. Uh, discussions were really good. It's a great time to kind of connect with your your uh, peers, talk about uh, how all these concepts that Marsha has has talked about how they apply to our online uh, environment. Thank you, Marsha, and uh, we'll be hopefully we'll be seeing you again in some other uh, session. Sounds great. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. Bye.